So I want to thank everybody for being a part of today's program. Uh, as Rick said, the name is Kevin Erb. I've been working in manure management in Wisconsin for University of Wisconsin Extension since the early 1990s. Prior to that, my family ran a manure hauling business in Illinois, and I like to say uh, my goal in life as a teenager was to get as far away from manure as possible, and I've turned it into a career. Um, what I want to spend some time today talking about is precision manure application, what technologies are out there, and kind of looking into the future in terms of where things are going to be going here. So let me advance to the next slide. So I often get the question, well, why is manure application late to the game? I mean, obviously we've had GPS grid soil sampling, variable rate technology for fertilizer since the very early 1990s. Yield monitors came into existence soon thereafter, but we really haven't seen the precision technologies in the significant dairy and beef areas like we have elsewhere. Part of the reason for that is that fertilizer can easily be blended on the fly to match need. Manure is an unknown. Uh, obviously, we have manure samples, but those come back from the lab several days or a week after we've made the application. The other thing is that manure's nutrients can be variable as we move uh, through that manure storage. And I think we need to realize that the economics of precision technology are different in these forage-based livestock systems. Now, obviously with that in mind, um, the folks in corn and soybean country uh, have a little bit different perspective on things, but the nice thing in corn and soybean rotations where I don't have livestock manure, I don't have forages, is that I've got data coming in every single year. I've got the yield monitor, I've got my GPS, and I can look at long-term trends. But if I look at something that maybe has alfalfa, corn silage in the rotation, up until the past couple of years, we really haven't had the yield monitor information that really looks not only at the tonnage coming off, but also because the nutrient value of that forage can vary as you go across the field from one cut to the next from season to season, it's been much more difficult there as well. So we've got the double whammy of manure density being variable. We've got nutrients obviously within that manure being variable and we've got that limited applicability. Really, if I've got the VRT technology, I'm only able to benefit from it in certain years during the rotation. The other thing from a manure application equipment perspective is that if I'm using a tractor pulled manure tanker for liquid, uh, once um, that particular application gets down lower in the tank, and maybe that pipe out the back isn't flowing at 100% capacity, flow meters are not going to be accurate. And if I look at something with the drag line systems, if I start varying the application rate, um, I change the pressure in the line, which can lead to ruptures and other problems as well. So with that as sort of a background, what's really changed or been different here in the past few years? Well, I think one of the things is we now have real-time nutrient sensing, not only for liquid manure, but solid manure as well. So as that manure actually leaves the spreader, we can measure real-time nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and dry matter. For those on the poultry side of things, um, solid manures, we now have real-time density sensing for solid manure. And with that real-time density sensing, now we can do things with variable rate technology. I'll talk about that here in a couple of minutes as well. We have the GPS-enabled automatic shutoffs now to avoid application errors, keeping us from getting too close to a stream uh, sensitive area or some type of setback. Uh, we've got low-cost location mapping. So maybe for those folks that have older tractors or can't afford to put in place some of the more expensive technologies we're talking about, we can actually just use an iPhone, iPad, Google, uh, tablet or whatever and place our location on the map and know exactly where we are in the field for very low cost. 
We've got the ability now to integrate weather and soil moisture data with irrigation. So for those folks in the uh, plains that tend to irrigate the runoff water from the feedlot, uh, we can now set that up so that it's fully automated so we don't oversaturate the soil, but also turn off that application with precipitation. And the long term, we're going to be able to integrate all of this data, this as applied data with the software used to generate nutrient management plans and close the loop entirely. So the first thing I want to spend a couple minutes talking about is that real time nutrient sensing. We've got multiple companies on the market right now with the liquid nutrient sensor. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Bergen here in a few minutes about what John Deere has uh, currently on the market, but there's a couple of other companies out there as well. There's also companies with nutrient sensors in the European market for both solid manure and compost. And the companies I've talked to are anticipating launching those here in the States later this year. So what are the benefits of sort of that real-time nutrient sensing? Well, the thing that we saw in Wisconsin last year, and this really helped us in a year where we had much more manure than we had land available because of how wet it was. When that excess rain or even drought impacts the nutrient concentrations in manure, uh, we are going to have a much greater potential for over or under application because we're running off of a book value or off of an average of the last three manure samples that we used on that particular uh, manure storage. And if we've got that ability to fine tune, and in the case last year with the plot that we did in Calumet County, Wisconsin, we had anticipated based on previous nutrient content, putting 8,000 gallons of manure to the acre. With the nutrient sensor, we were able to meet the nitrogen need that we wanted to but we had to put 12,000 gallons to the acre on to do it because of the dilution. And so this is one big area that I see of being able to really fine tune when we get into these situations where drought concentrates nutrients or excess rainfall dilutes nutrients as well. Some of the other benefits with the nutrient sensing, we can adjust the rate for the variation in soil type, soil texture. So I end up with some parts of the field that have a highly permeable soil, maybe my nitrogen rate has to be less with manure, I can adjust my rate on the fly. So instead of planning that entire field for the lowest rate, I can fine tune that to where it needs to be. Same thing with soil fertility. I can integrate those soil test data, that grid sampling, adjust my rate on the fly, and I can also adjust the rate based on crop history. What happens if I've got a field that last year was half in soybeans, half in corn, the nitrogen need for this year's corn is going to be different based on the, what was the previous crop in that now combined field. I can adjust on the fly. So some of the things we need to be thinking about keeping in the back of our mind, even with the nutrient sensing technology, the regulations your farming operation is under may still require you to have a manure sample for every million gallons for every day of application. You're not going to be able to avoid that until the regulations have changed. Another thing that we're working with a couple of the state regulatory agencies on is okay, you are applying based on the sensor, the lab value comes back as different than that, does that put you in violation? Obviously both are sort of a snapshot in time and it's something that the technology is ahead of the regulatory community, so you need to be working with the agency or organization that approves your nutrient management plan that has your permit to make sure they're gonna accept this technology as a functional equivalent and be prepared. Just like the case I talked about earlier, the plan called for 8,000 gallons to the acre. The sensor was putting on 12,000. Be able to justify why that's happening. So to move on a little bit to solid manure density sensing, um, particularly for our operations that tend to do feedlots, store manure outside, you can take one payloader scoop of manure, be very wet, the next can be drier. And when that's in the spreader, <coughs> excuse me, it will spread differently. 
And what a number of companies are doing now is using density sensors. Um, basically, we have load cells that are constantly weighing what's on the spreader and adjusting things based on the data they're seeing. So what can those density sensor technology uh, pieces do? Well, we can adjust the chain speed or the belt speed. We can adjust the beater speed or the spinner speed. It can be integrated to adjust the tractor speed or the opening on the apron. So there's a whole variety of ways that this technology can be used to adjust the rate. And a lot of that depends on the technology you already have in the tractor, compatibility, and what's on the spreader itself. One of the more exciting areas that I see in this is the GPS-enabled automatic shutoffs. And what you're seeing in the photo here is one from our field day uh, last year where we set up boundaries in the field and demonstrated how the technology could actually shut off the entire toolbar. Basically, you can do it two ways. You can do a simple on-off <clears throat> when you get to that imaginary line in the field the application turns off, you get past that waterway, past that setback, turns it back on. What's really neat about some of the European technologies that are out there, and this toolbar you see here, I believe, has that technology on it, is that we can shut down certain sections of that toolbar. So this particular toolbar, I believe, is divided into four or five sections. We can shut off the two sections on the right so that we stay back 50 feet from a well or whatever our setback is and still keep driving straight across the field. And that's really what we talk about as section control. Now, section control requires you have a GPS controller. You've got that field pre-mapped. You've got a pump on that tanker rather than gravity feed, and you may have to be able to divert flow back into the tanker if um, uh, shutting off that part of that toolbar might send more out the rest of the toolbar. So the automated systems, like I said, greatly reduce the chances of human error spreading and setbacks. Uh, we've got a few folks that are actually shutting things off at the headlands, so we're not over applying and making a mess when we're turning at the end of the field. Something else that's out there that a few folks are beginning to play with, what we call low-cost hazard mapping. So basically for folks that don't have the fancier technology in the tractors, may not want to invest now because they're going to upgrade their tractor in a year or two, really answers the question, where am I at right now in this field, so they know where they are in relation to setbacks. And this is really ideal for operations looking at something more low cost, lower budget. <clears throat> and what you see here is a sample uh, produced by a consultant, Steve Hoffman and Michelle Hoffman here in Northeast Wisconsin. But basically, it's a GPS-enabled Android or iPad tablet. The maps with the setbacks preloaded in it, and you can see the orange icon here that I've inserted that shows the location of the tractor in the field. And that way, middle of the night, no matter when, the operator knows where they are in relation to the setbacks and can shut off that equipment, turn it on, adjust the rate manually, whatever they need to do manually. So, couple of considerations from folks that have used this particular type of setup, not only here in Wisconsin, but other states uh, in the East Coast. Um, we really need to secure that tablet and the charging cord. Um, the charging cord tends to be repurposed for charging the operator's phone. And so locking that in a plastic case so that it can't be disconnected is strongly encouraged. And it does require somebody who knows what they're doing to set it up and put it together. So moving on here uh, to some of the other things that are um, more focused on irrigation. Um, for those that are using irrigation systems for the liquid portions of manure, we can integrate a rainfall sensor on that irrigation control to automatically turn off the system. If we do get a rainfall event, unfortunately, Sometimes that may end up being too late to actually prevent runoff. And so um, just be aware that it's not a perfect solution, but it does help. <coughs> Excuse me, I will point out 
that there is a current remote sensing project out there for soil moisture uh, through Coco Raz at um, Colorado. And what we're really trying to do with that is take remote sensing technology from the satellite, look at the soil surface and estimate soil moisture. And so the web link is available in the presentation uh, with the other handouts. And if you've got an interest in experimenting around and helping calibrate that model, uh, that would be appreciated. The final thing that I wanna talk about here is the automated updating of that planning software. Basically being able to take that as applied manure application data, whether it's rates, whether it's nutrient concentration or both, and pulling that back into the planning software, MMP, SNAP Plus, or whatever, really to eliminate data entry errors and make things simpler. The key caveat here is that any data generated by these automated systems must be verified by that crop consultant before being integrated into that reporting platform for regulatory purposes. Obviously, we know sometimes there are signal losses and other errors with the system and we would not want data automatically uploaded without being looked at that might imply that you spread down the middle of a four-lane highway when you didn't. So long term into the future, um, where are things going? I think we're on the cusp of really seeing some neat things in the manure arena. Uh, we did highlight many of these technologies, demonstrated them part of a NRCS CIG grant that I have with field days. And a lot of these I'll be working on here over the next few months to fully integrate into the advanced nutrient management scenarios as part of that CIG project. I want to give credit to that particular project for the funding they provided to move this forward. 